Keller. Welcome to No Priors. Thanks. Let's start with the basics. Tell us about yourself, what you were like as a kid, what you did right out of school. Have you always been working on crazy projects? Uh, you know, I <laughs> I feel like life is a winding path. I uh, In college, I built computers made of RNA and DNA that operate within human cells. I uh, you know, the goal was to build these molecular automata or molecular doctors that could recognize cancer on a cellular basis and and cure it. So I was really interested in biotechnology. I also got to build uh, a climbing wall in college. Uh, I was a professional rock climber right after graduating for a year and a half and then got pretty uh, obsessed with robotics. You know, it felt like there was a lot of really cool technology coming out of academic labs and no one was really making that technology work in the real world in a way that would be reliable enough that millions or tens of millions of people could really depend on it. And so the more we learned about robotics and automation, the more we got excited about logistics. It seemed like what you really want in in robotics is a super boring, repetitive task. And logistics Mm -hmm. is about as boring and repetitive as it gets. And then the more we learned about logistics, the more we understood that you know, it really serves the golden billion people on earth well, but it does a very bad job of serving the people outside of the golden billion. Uh, and for a hundred years, we've been making excuses for you know, why logistics is so unevenly distributed. We, you know, as a result of, of that, five and a half million kids lose their lives every year due to lack of access to basic medical products. And we pretend like this problem is unavoidable or somehow excusable. And we we just felt like it was neither of those things. It was like, well, if we're going to build a new kind of logistics system that would transform logistics toward, you know, automation, zero emission, 10 times as fast, let's also build the first logistics system that serves all people equally. And that was ultimately the vision that that created Zipline. Uh, It's it's an amazing vision. I want to get to how you went from rock climbing to logistics. But uh, for clarification first, what do you mean by golden billion? the richest billion people on earth. Got it. And you got obsessed with robotics. You weren't working on logistics at the beginning. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about Remotive? Yeah. I mean, when we, you know, the the tricky thing, and maybe this is true for more startups than you realize, the tricky thing is like, we didn't know we were starting a company when, you know, all all I knew was me and my co-founders didn't have jobs. And, it, you know, it seemed like a cool thing to do to build some robots. We put something on Kickstarter. We ended up selling $150,000 worth of robots on Kickstarter, which was a huge amount of money to us at the time. And we ended up building those robots in uh, the apartment of, it was it was my apartment at the time, but I mean, it was technically really Tony Shea's apartment. You know, Tony was kind of a, a mentor and inspiration to me. I had just read his book. Um, he lived in the exact same dorm I did in college just 10 years ahead of me. And so seeing like what he had built and, you know, I I didn't even know building a startup was a thing that you could do. But, you know, we, he had all these apartments in Las Vegas. He gave us a bunch of them. We started building robots in those apartments and shipping them to people all over the world. And these were really simple, right? Because we had no money, no credibility. We weren't that good at building robots at the time. So these were really simple. They were basically laser cut out of acrylic and you could attach your phone to it and it would become a little autonomous roving platform that you could use you know, to teach kids programming or to do telepresence. Um, it wasn't that good of an idea in retrospect, but it was, um, you know, it was the thing that ultimately uh, enabled us to, to actually, you know, ship something, make some money um, and, and learn and grow the company as we went. And how did you begin to get curious about logistics from these little roving robots? I think that what I realized, because the original vision for what we were doing is we were building thing, you know, we were building robots that would operate inside a house and like interact Mm -hmm. with people. And it didn't really work very well. Like in the first year, people were buying them, but they ended up going on a shelf after like a month or two. And so I had this sense that, you know, Okay, we could we could continue investing money here and and building this and even potentially selling the product, but I, I didn't think it was going to be a very sticky product in the long run. And as I mentioned, you know what you what you really want is like very boring, very repetitive tasks in controlled environments. And 
the home is not a controlled environment and there aren't very many like really boring repetitive tasks. It's all like a bunch of one at, one off tasks. Like people always ask, why can't you, you know, design a robot to fold my clothes? And if you think about like all the tasks that are required to fold clothes, that's like not repetitive at all. It's a really actually a really hard thing to get a robot to do well. And around the same time, I actually remember meeting the founder of a company called Kiva, which was uh, sold to to Amazon, I think in in like 2011 or 2012. Yeah. And they had designed these orange robots that would run all over the warehouse. It would basically go and lift up a bunch of shelves and bring the shelves to a human where the human could then grab things off the shelf and pack them. And so it was a way of automating warehouses, moving things around inside warehouses. And I remember seeing that thinking, wow, you know, someone is going to design Kiva for outside the warehouse. And that's going to be like a world changing company. Because if you could just move things back and forth outside, <laughs> you know, that would change the way the world looks. And uh, so, as, you know, a simple idea <laughs> turns out complex in execution. And also, I guess the, the last thing is that, you know, during that first year or two, it became clear that if we were going to make this work, like we'd have to commit our lives to it for 10 plus years. And so we started asking ourselves, like, what problem would be important enough that we would be very excited to spend a decade? By the way, a decade has ended up being, you know, an underestimate because we're now 10 years in and like we're just, you know, just There's getting started. We're, yeah, we're like 1% of the way there. But um you know, I, I think it was, it was a combination of basically saying, well, hey, like if we're going to commit ourselves to this, we could pick a bigger scope. We could pick a bigger ambition. We wanted to pick a problem that would really suit the technology well. Um, and we just had this sense that logistics was letting people down, that it could be so much better and more equally available. Well, that kind of answers one of my questions, which is like, how did you decide to work on blood and um medical supplies versus let's say burritos well it wasn't it wasn't us we okay. didn't i mean i mean to a certain degree yes you know we we had a sense <clears throat> you know doing something like this for the first time ever you know everything's hard it's hard to make the unit economics work. It's hard to get regulatory permission. It's hard to get the technology to do the thing. And so we did have a sense that, you know, if we were going to start and launch this in the real world fast, we would need to pick a use case that was incredibly important and clear to customers. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, it made a lot of sense to focus on healthcare logistics. I mean, Zipline, you know, healthcare logistics today is still our bread and butter. It's the majority of the deliveries that we do globally. Focusing on healthcare really enabled us to, it really helped us on each of those fronts. It was something that was super clear to our customers. It was uh, easier to make the unit economics work on day one because there's more willingness to pay for a delivery that is literally going to save a life. Uh, and it was easier to get regulatory permission because we would go hand in hand with the Minister of Health to the aviation authority and say, you know, hey, here's the challenge. Here are the lives that are on the line. We think it's worth taking a little bit of risk from a technology or regulatory perspective in order to save this many lives. But I, I would emphasize it. We were not the, smart enough to know like what we should focus on. You know, we I remember a conversation with the Minister of Health uh, of Rwanda in 2016, where you know, we went in saying, oh, we'll deliver to every hospital and health facility in the country. We'll deliver every medical product. You know, it'll be this full national scale logistics system. And she basically looked at us and said, shut up, just do blood. Uh, and well, it's good direction. Was, yeah. And, and she was, you know, she was like, I don't believe you. This sounds crazy, but she was willing to give us a shot. So the, the government ended up signing a contract with us to deliver blood to 21 hospitals. And as she was explaining it to us, she, she explained, you know, blood is total logistics nightmare, but it's really important for family health. So, you know, 50% of blood transfusions are going toward moms with postpartum hemorrhaging. 30% are going toward kids. Uh, it's a, when you need it, you really, really need it. And it's hard because there are all these different uh, components. You have platelets, plasma, cryoprecipitates, packed red blood cells. For a lot of those, you have different types, A, B, A, B, and O, positive and negative RH factor. And then each of those components has different shelf lives and, and storage requirements. So plasma frozen lasts a year. Uh, packed red blood cells, refrigerated, last 30 days. Platelets, room temperature have to be constantly agitated and only last six days. So it's a really, really hard logistics problem for a healthcare system. And uh, we, we said yes. You know, we, we, we 
We said, great, we'd lo- you know, we're know, we happy to do blood. We thought that was going to be easy. It turned out it was not easy. It was incredibly hard. And the company almost died just trying to serve those 21 hospitals during the first year. Um, and then, you know, over the last six years, it's it's expanded dramatically. We can talk about a little bit more about that, too. Yeah. Before we um, get into that, maybe you could just help our listeners visualize the problem of how a delivery actually works. Can you just walk through if it's, you know, the Ministry of Health or one of those hospitals, like uh, how one drone delivery happens today? Yeah, the, you know, the idea is really simple. It really is that any doctor, nurse or, you know, healthcare technician can push a button on a phone and summon you know, we, we talk about what we do as teleportation. It really means they can basically teleport a product directly to their GPS coordinates. That's that's the vision. It should it should you know feel like magical uh, teleportation. It should be nearly instantaneous, and it needs to be reliable. And that also means we need to be able to work in any weather, twenty four seven. So, what's practically happening behind the scenes to make that work is that. Uh, you know, any of our any of our customer hospitals. So today we serve 3000 hospitals and health facilities across the world. Um, Anybody at those facilities can press a button on a phone and place an order. That order is then transmitted to our fulfillment center. So each of our distribution centers, Zipline now operates, uh, I think by the end of January, we'll be operating over 20 global distribution centers. Each distribution center has a fulfillment uh, area where we stock all of these different medical products. Blood was the first thing that we stocked. Uh, so we, we get the order. Uh, we will confirm it. We'll pack the products, whatever that is that's needed, into a box. And then that box gets handed to flight operations. Flight operations then uh, will pre-flight an aircraft, load the box into the aircraft, launch the aircraft. Um, and we we don't have runways where we operate, might not be obvious. So that means that we you know, we launch using a catapult system, we land using something that sort of looks like the landing system for an aircraft carrier, you sort of have to see it to believe it. Um, but we'll put links in the show notes. Yeah. But the you know the 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 simple vision is you know aircraft launches, flies itself autonomously to uh, one of these hospitals or primary care facilities descends to about 30 feet. It never lands. It never stops. Uh, we drop the package using a really simple paper parachute that enables us to deliver to a uh, what we call their mailbox, which is the size. You sort of just think of it as like an imaginary rectangle on the ground that's the size of a couple parking spaces. Uh, and then the aircraft comes comes home, lands. We can swap batteries. And we can have the aircraft back in the air about two minutes later. So our distribution centers were designed to do about 150 flights a day. For the first three years, that was a total pipe dream. Everybody thought that that number was completely impossible. We now have distribution centers doing north of 300 deliveries a day. Um, So over the last six years, it's gone from being this sort of niche thing where we're figuring out the technology to then scaling, getting to the point where, you know, we deliver a majority of a lot of these critical medical products in all these different countries where we operate. Uh, And then today where it's the largest commercial autonomous system on earth of any kind. So this is just unbelievable. Uh, It's a first of its kind systems company. It's at scale. Um, I'm sure I'm going to miss components, but you make a fixed wing, long range, low cost autonomous drone. You're doing hardware, software, sensors, autonomy, weather forecasting, external UI for doctors, internal apps, integrations with hospital systems, air traffic control, and I'm sure a thousand other things, not to mention all of the massive operational um, capabilities on the ground you just described with distribution and fulfillment centers. Um, You mentioned the company almost died trying to serve the first 21 hospitals. How big was the team that made the first delivery? Who did you have to make that happen? When we launched in uh, Rwanda in 2016, I think we were about 20 people. And that's wild. Yeah. And for sure, that was a near-death experience. And it was actually a near-death experience for exactly the sort of the reason you were just pointing out. We didn't fully appreciate we needed to be how full stack of a company we needed to be. We had sort of fooled ourselves into thinking, well, we've had this awesome vehicle. It's going to work great. Like we can just launch. And it turns out that you know, the vehicle is only like 15% of the complexity of the solution here. This is, by the way, a problem or a realization that I think most robotics and autonomy companies have not yet had. (laughs) Like you don't really realize it until you start trying to serve customers and suddenly have this really rude awakening that like the customer does not care how, you know, cool the robot is (laughs) or, you know, how, how even how capable it is. Like for our customers, the only thing that matters is does the product go from A to B 
ultra fast, reliably 24 seven, fast enough to save someone's life. And it turns out that all of the different layers of technology that have to be built in the background, sort of running behind the curtain to make that overall customer experience work, the drone is 15% of the complexity. There's so much complexity. And a lot of things you mentioned, you know, air traffic control software that we have to provide to the regulator, computer vision-based pre-flight checks, data logging, very unsexy, but turns out it's a very hard problem. You know, each aircraft is generating a gigabyte of data that you have to... You have to upload that data and uh, use it to make the vehicles more reliable over time. That's a hard problem in and of itself. Detect and avoid and autonomy solutions that enable the vehicles to communicate with each other and avoid each other in in an airspace uh, and avoid other airplanes. Uh, So there's a huge amount of complexity. I think people just intuitively get very focused on, you know, the physical thing that looks cool, which is, yeah, the autonomous airplane. But uh, the reality is that's a small part of what was actually required by our customers. Uh, so how did you decompose such a, a hairy problem? Was there like you obviously discovered more of it as you got into it, but was there an overarching philosophy? Uh, you know, there was no plan. We were we were severely naive when we launched in 2016. There is no doubt about it. I mean, we thought that, We had done some testing in Half Moon Bay, California, and we thought we were ready to operate at national scale in Rwanda in any weather. (laughs) It sounds kind of silly when you describe it in retrospect, but, you know, we we were so confident when we launched. And for the first nine months, we only served one hospital, not 21. You know, we were wise enough to say, well, we're going to onboard the first hospital and make sure it's working reliably for that hospital before we try to do more. We thought that was going to take two weeks. It ended up taking nine months. Uh, We were killing ourselves, pulling constant all-nighters, trying to fix all of these problems that suddenly became apparent when we started trying to deliver reliably to this one hospital. And I don't think this was a philosophy. Like, I think we were, you know, it's not like we were wise enough to know how hard this was going to be. Maybe if we knew how hard it was going to be, we wouldn't have done it to begin with. But uh, I do think- You might have thought you needed- uh, I don't know, 200 more money, more 20, time, yeah. more people, but we didn't have any of those things. <laughs> you know, we, we had no credibility. Nobody was going to invest money into the company. Um, yeah, you just don't have those things and you don't know what you don't know. And I guess in this case, you know, our na- it was lucky that we were so naive, but I think the reality is the thing that really did differentiate Zipline during that year of extreme pain and near death and, and constant all-nighters was, you know, we were never the biggest company in this space. We were not the best funded company for sure. I mean, you know, there was a big e-commerce company in Seattle investing billions of dollars trying to build similar technology. Uh, But we, and we never even necessarily thought of ourselves as the smartest team, but we were always by far the most practical. Like that was in our DNA. We knew we wanted to get, if we were going to work on this, we were going to launch it into the real world and ask customers to pay us for the service right away with no excuses. And the reality is, especially with something this complicated, when you take the first version of your product and put it into a customer's hands and ask them to pay you money, it is a deeply humbling experience. You instantly realize why the thing that you built and love sucks (laughs) and is failing, (laughs) you know? And that's like, it's a deeply unpleasant, upsetting experience. Um, and I would say that is how it felt for, you know, the whole first year of trying to operate and falling on our faces, making every possible mistake. But interestingly, all the things that we would have thought were going to be the problems ended up being irrelevant. And all the things that really ended up being major problems or kind of screwing us in terms of reliability or weather or pre-flight checks, we weren't even thinking about them. That's so interesting. Like, what's a what's an example of something you thought was going to be like fatally difficult and like didn't matter? Um, I think that we invested way too much money in the early days on things like, you know, flight computer reliability and redundancy. We designed this really uh, sexy, like, th- you know, two by two system where, you know, it was two flight computers running in lockstep and then, and then, you know, another redundant flight computer. So it's like, if anything failed on the flight computer, you know, we felt confident that the vehicle could still get itself home. And I mean, 
to this day, I'm not sure that we have ever actually had to use that architecture to take care of Like, it's just not the thing that ended up failing. There are a lot of other things on the aircraft that ended up failing. So we, we ended up investing all this time building this, you know, sexy architecture on the flight compute side that wound, that wound up, um, we were off by orders of magnitude in terms of the things that were really going to hurt us. What about on the other side? Oh, there are so many things. So many things. I mean, yeah, where do you start? But we could talk for an hour about, you know, the hard learnings from from that side. But just to give a few examples, I mean, one data logging wound up being way harder than we were we were anticipating. Uh, and you know, that sounds like trivial. I mean, sounds trivial, but it's definitely not. It turns out it's hard. Um you know, the maintenance of the vehicle wound up, you know, we had 43 different kinds of fasteners in the first design of the aircraft. Today's aircraft has two total kinds of fasteners in the airplane. Uh, you just realize when you're trying to keep 43 different kinds of fasteners in stock, and then you cannot fly an aircraft if you run out of stock of one of those, it's just, you realize like, okay, we're, this is a huge problem. Uh, you know, acquiring G- pre-flight checks and uh, acquiring GPS pre-launch fast enough so that you, you know, you get an order, you put a package into an aircraft, and then that aircraft automatically has GPS lock and can launch. Turns out to be really hard. And the entire vehicle has to be designed around optimizing for that problem. And we did not optimize the first aircraft around that problem because we didn't know it was a thing. Reliability of the rotors and the stators inside of the electric motor wound up being a major problem. We saw delamination of some of the components inside the motors because we airshipped the first uh, 20 aircraft to Rwanda. I mean, Mm -hmm. these are like really, you know, in the weeds, detail-oriented things that we had no idea were going to hurt us and wound up being life-threatening to the company um, for us to learn these lessons. And you just can't imagine it until you run into it. You cannot imagine until you run into it. And it, and that's the thing, like, we, you know, when we talk to robotics or hardware companies today, and a lot of them have raised large amounts of money, I mean, billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars in some cases, and have yet to serve customers, you just have this sense of, like, doesn't matter how much money you've raised, it is going to be a rude awakening when you actually start charging customers for your product, because that is when you actually <laughs> learn all of the things that you need to fix and all the things that are going to be super important to build. Uh, and so I do think the thing, although it was incredibly painful, the thing that really enabled us to survive that period was that we we were very practical and unfancy and we got things into customers' hands quickly and we learned by doing. And we assumed that we were idiots. And it turns out that that assumption was 100% correct. And even to this day- That's not basic, fair. <laughs> well, I, I, that's how we talk about it internally. And you know, even to this day, when I talk to new Zipline team members, I mean, Zipline's now almost 1,000 people. Um, but you know, when we talk to new Zipline team members at distribution centers or joining the engineering team, we're basic, we basically we say, assume that we're idiots because we're proven correct more often than not. Uh, you know, your customer will tell you what really matters. Like, we don't know anything. And so even, even six years in, seven years in to like commercial operations, when we're launching new products or new features... We always learn hard lessons when we actually get the product into people's hands. Okay, Keller, you know, fast forward six or seven years, a lot of this stuff actually works pretty well now at Zipline. Assume I'm an idiot and I'm going to ask you a very basic question. We have this largely technical audience, but even for a lay software engineer, it's not obvious what the difference is between like AI and autopilot which every commercial flight uses some degree of already. I recently took like a small plane, the Cirrus Vision Jet, that only requires one pilot because it's got this like cool automatic emergency landing system. Where are we in terms of aircraft and drone autonomy? And that might be like a stupid question to ask because those might be very, very different. But, you you know, what are the parts of flying that existing autonomy systems can't handle where where you guys had to do a lot of work? Yeah, the... uh... You know, the advantage of uh, flying in the air is there are not very many things to hit. So actually, I think this might be counterintuitive, but you know, the self-driving problem in the air is way easier than the self-driving problem on roads. Like people I, might have this sense that oh, you know, airplanes even harder than cars. Actually, definitely not. Like a thousand times easier. Uh, and the reality is much like. Uh, the self-driving problem on the ground, you know, certainly there are all kinds of cool use cases. There's a lot of cool research going on uh, about using, you know, neural nets and, uh, 
you know, doing advanced state estimation and motion planning. You know, it's called SLAM in robotics. So, you know, building control algorithms, state machines, um, and then building computer vision systems that can help, you know, or, or LIDAR systems that can help like model and estimate the environment around you and recognize, you know, when a kid runs in front of the car or when, you know, another airplane is flying too close to you in the air. Like these kinds of autonomy problems are still very hard um, and are not solved at like human safety level in either direction. But the good thing about the air is that, you know, the chances are so vanishingly small of having an air to air. I mean, the air is a really big place. The sky is a big place, you know. So the reality is, you know, we were able to operate at multinational scale without having to solve really hard, like cutting edge computer vision problems. Uh, and I think that wound up being a good choice. You know, we thought of like the company that kind of inspired us on this front was Tesla. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw like Tesla and then Google we were looking at, right? And Tesla had kind of come up, had said, we're going to ship a, what I think they thought at the time was a dead simple product, just like put a battery in a car and then like sell the car, right? Don't try to design an autonomous car from scratch. And then there was like the Waymo approach of, we're going to build a fully autonomous car. It's a total moonshot. And we're not going to like sell a single thing to a customer until it's working. And so Zipline felt 100% the right path was like the Tesla path. Launch something that's ultra simple that we felt confident we could get into the real world quickly that we could make money on and learn from and then start to integrate autonomy thereafter. And uh, I think in retrospect, that was definitely the right choice. There are other companies in, you know, the drone delivery industry that I think have taken more of a moonshot approach and they've spent billions of dollars and have not served a single customer yet. So the advantage is now, you know, Zipline has been able to get to this scale where our ability to collect data, our ability to know what the actual problems are, our ability to know what our customers want and are willing to pay for um, is much higher. And we're now integrating, you know, new autonomy systems into the overall service network every, you know, every quarter. We just announced this new detect and avoid technology and kind of our Zipline's full autonomy stack last year. Um, we are going through a certification process with the FAA for that autonomy stack as we as we speak. Can we talk about that a little bit? Um, so you, you mentioned it before. It's a it's an acoustic based detect and avoid system, which is a new idea. Um, I think a lot of people who might come from the the software side or, you know, other parts of autonomy might be like radar, LIDAR, et cetera. For context for our listeners, problematically, in the U.S., a significant number of aircraft don't have to carry transponders, which are like little radios that broadcast your presence and location of other aircraft. And Keller, am I correct that drones don't have any right of way, in, you know, in airspace? That's exactly right. And so it's their job to avoid all these other aircraft, but you don't know where they are. So yep. a person looking around for them. Can you walk us through just like how you're solving this issue? And, and like, I think people can infer you're basically listening for aircraft. That's kind of wild. It is. It's 100% wild. I, so detect and avoid is kind of what you would call the problem. It's, you know, detect and avoid has been a problem uh, for autonomous flight in the U.S. for 20 years. Because as you said, you know, a unmanned aircraft does not have any right of way. The assumption is you have to be the one avoiding everybody else. And by the way, the detect and avoid of like a human pilot sitting in a cockpit is also extremely poor. I don't, I don't want to freak anybody out who, you know, flies in aircraft a lot. But the reality is that um, if you're in an unmanned vehicle, you have to solve the problem. You And, and, and you're right, you know, transponders um, are you know, technically required, but compliance is very low, especially in um, GA, you know, general aviation. And so you can't rely on transponders. You have to be able to know, you know, you have to be able to see something when it enters. We call it the, you know, the two mile hockey puck. It's a, you know, a two mile hockey puck around, around your vehicle. You need to know if something enters that hockey puck and then you need to be able to actively avoid it. Why is it called a hockey puck? Um, Because it's like a circle around you, but then it's a, uh, you know, a set amount of space above you and below you. So I imagine okay. the shape of a hockey puck. Yep. Um, yeah. And a lot of companies have been trying to solve this problem for the last decade. It's a really hard problem to solve because there's just no really good sensing solution. I mean, you can imagine LIDAR, radar, computer vision, you know, cameras, 
Each of those, I mean, LIDAR and radar, very heavy, very power consumptive. They're expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. And like the, you know, the, the, fe- the field of view is not very, I mean, radar, you might have like 30 degree, you know, um, field of view. And so then how many like radar systems are you going to have on your vehicle? And, you know, we're talking about a fit, an aircraft that weighs 50 pounds in total and you care a lot about payload, right? I mean, we're optimizing, we spend huge amounts of time optimizing for ounces. I mean, in, in our case, grams, you know, we, but uh, you spend a lot of time, basically every gram matters. And so you have no weight to spare as an electric aircraft. Like the battery is heavy. You want to deliver a lot of payload. There's no, you care a lot about weight and power consumption. And uh, and so radar, LIDAR, like getting those to provide a, a really good 360 view, that's, it's, it doesn't work very well. And then you can say, well, cameras, they're lighter and cheaper. Yes, but they don't work in clouds. So basically you know, immediately you can rule out cameras as a sole solution because you need to work in clouds. Like, you know, clouds are a common thing. (laughs) So, you know, about four years ago, an engineer on the team, as we were basically realizing, we got to go solve this problem. Like there's no technology available off the shelf that's going to solve this problem. And Zipline is at a scale now that is, you know, a hundred times the next closest player. And so it's like, not not like anybody's going to build this for us. Like we had to build it for ourselves. And uh, a member of the team basically said, well, I have, you know, had this really stupid idea, which was like, what if we just listened? What if we could just listen for, for other aircraft and then triangulate them, you know, in the way that you, know, you can imagine like our ears echolocate. We're not that good at it, but yeah. can we literally echolocate like things? Like a dolphin. Be, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, a dolphin's actually um, active right. acoustic. We are okay, passive, passive acoustic. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sonar is a little different. Um but uh, yeah, so you're, you're, you know, can we passively listen? And we thought, and we, we basically heard that and we're like, yeah, that for sure won't work, but let's <laughs> just quickly disprove it via, you know, some engineering prototypes. And we then did some experiments and we failed at disproving the idea in those early experiments. And so we said, okay, well, why don't we put like a two person team on this? Uh, because we're pretty sure like the first prototype will show us why it won't work. And then first prototype also failed at showing us why it wouldn't work. And it kind of became like the plan of record for us. And over the last four years, you know, we invested a lot. Like we had a a large like mechanical engineering, signal processing, uh, machine learning team working together to figure out how to build a microphone array, make it work when it's traveling through the air at 80 miles an hour, which is not an easy thing in and of itself. Like if you imagine, you know, putting this microphone, like, and having it travel through the air. And yeah, you can imagine what that would sound like. Um, so you're really hard, um, mechanical engineering problems, you know, microphone design problems, there are hard signal processing problems, there are hard machine learning problems. Speaking of that, did you, did you collect your own data for this? Because I assume like, you know, there's not like (laughs) good location, trajectory, audio at 80 miles an hour pairs just sitting out there on the internet for you. Yep. 100%. And so we had to collect, you know, we had to collect our own data by flying a lot of microphones on airplanes, but we also collected a lot of data by designing this little system that we had at our office where we literally literally just had a microphone array sitting on the ground 24-7 recording airplanes flying overhead. Uh, So, yeah, we had to build the data set ourselves. But, I mean, the amazing thing is that four years in, you know, we rolled the hardware into full production uh, and then, you know, we turned it on in shadow mode across a lot of the countries where we operate. And we've now gotten active permission from regulators and are actually flying using it where it can now control the aircraft if it needs to, to deconflict from another airplane. Uh, And, you know, that system, it actively listens. It can identify the make and the model of an aircraft. Is that accurate? Because it turns out these, you know, these neural nets, if you train them on a lot of different aircraft and what they sound like, it's really good at telling you, um, what it's hearing and where the thing is in the hockey puck. And the beauty of it, of course, is that microphones are extremely cheap. They weigh almost nothing. um, And it is naturally a 360 solution because that's how sound works. So super counterintuitive. And honestly, I think most people would have just rejected that idea out of hand because it sounds dumb. Uh, But it turns out that it solves the problem. And that's what's going to enable Zipline to fly full scale uh, beyond visual end of sight um, in 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 any country on Earth. Yeah. And in clouds. (laughs) Let's zoom out and talk a little bit about Zipline as a business. So counterintuitively to perhaps many people like me and you that kind of live in the Bay Area, it's a 
hotbed for innovation. The government of Rwanda was your first customer. Like, why did you guys start in Africa? We have healthcare deserts and access issues in the U.S. too. Well, uh, w- when we knew we wanted to start in healthcare, we thought that it uh, probably made sense to start with a public healthcare system rather than a private healthcare system because, you know, advantage of a public healthcare system is you can go and work directly with a country and then you serve all hospitals and primary care facilities. Whereas in the U.S., we have so many different health systems. It's really complicated. You have to work one by one. And so, and we had a sense that we probably needed wor- to work with a country that was small, innovative, and agile in the same way that we were. Um, And so that led us to focusing on some of these really high performing public health systems in Africa. We felt like the problems were super clear. Uh, We had a government that was as innovative and entrepreneurial as we were. And uh, they were willing to move quickly and make regulatory exceptions also in a way that the FAA just can't do. Um, So all three of those things wound up creating a strong partnership between us and the government of Rwanda in 2016. That's a partnership that, you know, we have been grateful for. I mean, they put up with a lot. Like we were, we had no idea what we were doing in the first year. You know, as I mentioned, we were trying to serve 21. We served one hospital for nine months. They were very patient with us. They knew we were trying to do something for the first time in the world ever, and that it wasn't going to necessarily be a smooth path. Um, But you know, looking back, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced this new national scale partnership that we signed with the government. It's a $61 million partnership. Zipline is now delivering all medical products to every hospital and health facility in the country. And we are the largest logistics network in the country. We not only deliver all healthcare products, but you know, we began delivering medical products to pe- t- directly to patients' homes. Then we began delivering a lot of other products. You know, we're now we now deliver a wide variety of agriculture products that increases productivity of farmers, decreases childhood malnutrition, brain stunting, cycles of poverty. Um, we're working with them around uh, providing an e-commerce solution. You know, th- it's becoming full national scale infrastructure. And by the way, you know, as part of that, Rwanda. Uh, made, I think, what's the largest investment into any private company the country has made into Zipline. So is, now a, um, is yeah. now a shareholder in the company. So, you know, seven years in, it's been it's been an amazing partnership. We're really, really proud that we've been able to kind of learn together. And, you know, now so many other countries are following suit. I mean, Zipline launched in Ghana. Today we serve, I think, 1,800 hospitals and health facilities in Ghana. Uh, late last year, we launched in Nigeria. In January, we're launching in Cote like this month, we're launching in Cote d'Ivoire in Kenya, and we began operating in the U.S. We now have three distribution centers in the U.S. So, yeah, started small, but, it, you know, I do think Zipline's survival depended on finding a partner that would move equally fast and be equally agile. So what is the biggest challenge to, you know, getting Zipline everywhere for more more goods? Is it make the system magnitude cheaper? Is it just engagement with partners? Um, I think the meta challenge is that hardware is hard, you know, and especially when you're a full stack company where you design the vehicle, you manufacture the vehicle, and then you operate the entire vehicle and service for customers. There's a lot that goes into that. Zipline has to be really good at supply chain. We have to be really good at supplier industrialization engineering. We have to be really good at manufacturing. We have to be really good at logistics. We have to be really good at all the different kinds of engineering, right? Whether it's electrical engineering, firmware engineering, software engineering, mechanical engineering, aero, aerodynamics, aeroacoustics. And then we also have to be really good at operations. Like we have to know how to operate fulfillment centers. We have to ha- know how to get regulatory approval in the countries where we operate. We have to know how to do flight operations. We have to do maintenance. So I think the challenge is that this kind of infrastructure is complicated and it, it's not like a software company where you can just scale 100x in a year. You know, it's sort of similar to Tesla, where Tesla has been in this crazy position of being um, massively supply constrained for five years because it's like you can only build factories so fast. But I think the flip side of that is that although hardware is hard, I do think that those companies wind up being some of the most defensible companies on Earth. Like They have very powerful competitive modes um, because, you know, really hard to compete with a hardware company at massive scale. It's the reason it'd be hard to build a new kind of smartphone and compete with Apple. Um, So certain things about building the company are really hard, but I I think the flip side is 
I do think a lot of the most important companies for humanity that are going to be built over the next 20 years are going to be hardware and infrastructure companies. Uh, They are more capital intensive. They are harder to build, but they also have way more momentum and inertia. And I think powerful competitive advantages. And they're worth they're worth building. Right. And uh, as an investor, I'm excited to back them. Yes. I mean, I think so. Like, I, I although I, th- I feel like there are a lot of investors who, who I, I, you know, I'm speaking to a venture capitalist, but I do think that over the last 20 years, I think a lot of America and investors, like, I feel like we lost our vision for the future. You know, I grew up watching Star, War- Star Wars and Star Trek. I was a big Trekkie, huge nerd. Me too. Like the vision that we were promised of robotics and, you know, automation and nuclear fusion and genetic engineering and life extension, you know, and some of that's working interstellar space travel. I think you're right. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I think it is. But I think in general, you know, the tech industry in the U S was a lot more focused, at least for a, you know, a decade or two on smaller ideas of, you know, know, incremental SaaS uh, products and things like that. And, it was impossible to raise money for, it was very difficult to raise money for Zipline for the first six years, right? Like, I, I mean, I think it's only recently that investing in robotics has, and genetic engineering has become a thing. So I, I think in general, the exciting vision of the future is not one where, you know, we're designing like the metaverse and, and you know, NFTs and we're all like living in a digital world while actually like depending on the crumbling infrastructure that our grandparents built for us. Like, that's crazy. Why is the U.S. not, you know, why are we not building more highways, more tunnels, you know, more, more new, new, new kinds of aircraft, new kinds of spaceships? Like, there's so much to, to build. And I think that we lost our imagination and appetite for building things in the real world, a little bit, at least. And I, I, but I agree with you. I think that that's changing. And I think that that's really exciting. And that is the thing that, you know, it inspires us every day. It's like, let's go build national or multinational scale infrastructure that can save millions of lives and make the world a more equal place. Like what's cooler than that? Well, you're an inspirational entrepreneur for, I think, the next generation, Keller. Um, and I, I hope to see many more companies that, you know, have those goals. Maybe w- one last question for you about the business. 2022 was a big year. You, uh, you know, expanded geography, as you described. You got that FFAA certification. You signed a deal with Walmart. I believe you made over 200,000 deliveries, which is more the last five years combined. You hired uh, Deepak Ahuja, former Tesla CFO, among other amazing talent. Like, what can you tell us about what's next? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I was just talking to the team about this. I mean, 2023, Zipline is definitely in the middle of a very intense growth period. Um, And I don't know, I guess our timing stinks because we're doing it during a a large, you know, macroeconomic recession. But actually, the reality is, you know, the, 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 the forces that are causing the recession also are sort of accelerating Zipline because inflation, like the increasing cost of labor and gasoline are the things that sort of cause customers to adopt our business. Partly for that reason, 2023 is going to be an intense year of growth. We're going to increase, uh, you know, total flight volume by 400% in 2023, based just on contracts that are already signed. Um, So that means we'll do about two times as many autonomous deliveries in 2023 as we've done in the history of the company since its founding. So, you know, there, that's a lot of work. Um, handling that kind of scale is hard. Things break basically every single day when you're growing that fast. We're also, you know, dramatically expanding. You, know, you mentioned the partnership with Walmart. Uh, we've signed a lot of other partnerships with big players in the U.S., uh, Intermountain Healthcare, Navant Healthcare, Multicare, uh, Michigan Medicine. These are all big um, hospital systems that are now relying on Zipline to take over, to basically build autonomous instant delivery directly to homes. Uh, we really think of teleportation as just the other half of telepresence. So if a health system can, you know, if you can pull out a phone and talk remotely to a doctor and that doctor can diagnose you, the health system should then be able to say, awesome, we know what you need. It's going to be on your doorstep in five minutes. That That's expanding the service in the U.S. is is kind of a, a big priority. But as I mentioned, I mean, we're building four new, we have four new distribution centers coming online just in January, um, two in Nigeria, one in Kenya, one in Cote d'Ivoire, it's a huge amount of work. We are also launching, um, well, there's a really big new thing that we'll be announcing in a couple of months that I, you know, can't, can't talk too much about, but yeah, something that we've been building for the last three years and that I think is going to be quite transformational to, to the logistics industry broadly. So, um, 
we'll look out. We'll look out for this launch. Um, yeah. I, I hope you you won't mind me saying so, but there are a lot of ways in which Zipline as a company is kind of unlikely, right? As you said, everything is hard for those founders. Or so many of our listeners are founders who may want to tackle similarly audacious problems instead of um, perhaps something trivial and incremental. What what advice would you offer them about a secret that has made Zipline work to date? I heard one thing from you, which is be ruthlessly practical. Yeah, I think that Zipline was 100% improbable. There's no doubt about it. And when we started building the company, you know, I, I told the team, I remember we were at a Christmas party where we all fit around one table at a little hole in the wall Chinese restaurant. And I think someone on the team asked like, well, what do we think are the chances of success? And I said, I think the chances of success are about 1%. And everybody was kind of upset, but then I was like, "But guys, it's it, but, you know, it's it's one percent of a, of a totally world changing. I mean, if we actually succeeded at automating logistics and making it serve all people equally, and providing universal access to healthcare to every single person on Earth, and transitioning all of last mile logistics to zero emission, I mean, that's that would be so world changing. Like, it's it's worth it. I think it takes a special kind of person to want to work on a project that has a 1% chance of success. And Zipline was thoughtful about making sure that we hired people who were okay doing something that was risky and where failure was a very real and likely option. Um, But that doesn't mean we shouldn't work on those things. And also, you know, a lot of those ideas that are most challenging, most ambitious, most scary, there's less competition. You know, Zipline, uh, today, I mean, yeah, we don't, we, we look around, it's like no other companies are operating at anywhere near the scale, right? And so it's like, you know, choosing these less ambitious, more incremental problems, um, you end up being in perfect price competition with a lot of other folks working on the exact same thing. Whereas, you know, setting your sights a little farther ahead and saying, hey, we, we think the world is going to be this way in five years or 10 years, and, you know, we'll work, in unfancy, scrappy, practical ways for a decade. I do think, you know, that's is, I mean, you can build really important companies that way. And I think that there are definitely investors out there who are willing to fund those kinds of ideas, because I think those kinds of ideas are often become the biggest companies. So I I guess that's my advice. It's like, I don't know that it's for everybody, but I also think that, I mean, I guess I think the biggest thing that I would say is technology has a bad rap. Like we can look around and see the biggest problems that are affecting humanity. And I think, unfortunately, the way the world kind of thinks about it is like, oh, you know, technology is going to serve the richest people on the coasts of the United States. And then all the problems that really matter for humanity, like childhood malnutrition, brain stunting, you know, reproductive health for women, democracy, free speech, you know, energy and sustainability, like all of these problems actually, in, in many cases, get left up to like government or nonprofits, which is really bad because government and nonprofits are are bad at solving problems and are incapable of deploying technology. <laughs> Sorry to be, I mean, I'm, that's not. No, I completely totally agree. Uh, the mass, vast majority of the time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so it's a, I'm like, you know, being a little bit provocative, but uh, I think that the reality is like all of these problems that impact six billion humans plus and that like are crying out to be solved for humanity at global scale. Like they require engineering, they require technology, they require sustainable business models so that we can actually scale a solution once it's built. And I think that, you know, having the smartest engineers and entrepreneurs graduating from the best colleges and then going to work for, you know, a large search engine to help them sell like 0.1% more ads. Like it's not actually a great um, application of humanity's talent. One of the most important things that we have, you know, tried to prove is that you can build a multi-billion dollar company focusing on important problems for humanity. And you, you know, and there's an opportunity for like the smartest, most driven engineers and entrepreneurs and operations specialists in the world to work on problems that really matter and, and you know, will make the world a better place if they can be solved. And by the way, showing that that's not like, that's not about philanthropy. The la- you know, the thing that drives me crazy is a lot of people look at Zipline and they're like, oh, it's so generous of you. It's so philanthropic that you operate in these countries. And we're always like, 
That is exactly the wrong way to understand what we do. You know, we make money in all of these countries. It is gross margin profitable at almost all of our distribution centers. And the whole point here is that like sustainable unit economics, building a profitable business is how we actually scale solutions that can work and 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 solve problems for like 6 billion people. So we believe very strongly in like entrepreneurship and, you know, as an innovation engine for, for good. Yeah, as an yeah. engine to solve these problems and to make the world a more equal place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do too, but it's amazing seeing an example of it. Uh, Keller, uh, we are up against time and that's all we can do today. I was so looking forward to uh, this interview. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. 